This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everybody and uh, welcome to what is going to be a beautiful sunrise safari. Um, it is clear skies and therefore we should actually get a sunrise this morning which will be quite nice. But before we get into all of the things for the day, my name is Tristan on camera, I've got BK this morning and um, it is a very warm welcome to all of you. I hope that you are going to interact with us and you're going to talk to us and ask us questions and give us comments um, so that we are filled with lots of things to talk about and you can do so using hashtag Wild Earth or at FC on the YouTube chat stream. Now, I'm not sure what my plan is this morning. I'm a bit torn between a number of different things. Um, so at the moment I'm just bumbling. I think I'm going to take Zoe's down to Treehouse. I'm going to scratch around. Maybe we get lucky with the hook being around. Um, but otherwise, I think maybe towards Chitwa, see if Sibuya and Cubs potentially has made an appearance. Um, but I do need to apologize. I'm pretty sure James and I are both going to be blurry-eyed this morning. Um, our delightful state-owned electricity company was at its finest form last night and neither one of us slept very much at all because the mosquitoes were just quite something last night. Um, and they were in fact so bad that James Henry, if you can believe this, even put on insect repellent. Yes, that's right everybody. James put on insect repellent because that's how bad they were. Um, and that combined with the swelteringly hot um, roof that was radiating heat and it felt like it was a pizza oven with a horrible twist in it. Just looking at these impalas, they were quite sort of alert. Um, there's lots and lots of tracks for hyenas at the moment, um, but these guys look fairly twitchy, um, as though they've seen something this morning. Um, you see what I mean? Look at how they're all kind of up and sort of looking in this direction. Um, I didn't see any tracks or any sign of anything, but, you know, sometimes it's good just to stop and have a little look. Sometimes some random things can pop out. Um, you see what I mean? Look at how they looking in this direction, very unsure of what's going on. Particularly this female in front. She's very twitchy at the moment. Um, is there something there, girl? I haven't alarm called or made a snort or anything like that. Um, it could also just be our presence here um, could be triggering them to be this way, but they certainly are not very comfortable at all. What have you guys seen? Graham, you would like to know what BK stands for. BK? Bocomorso. There we go. Um, so it's BK's name. Um, and uh, that's why it's just been shortened because I probably find people butcher poor BK's name regularly. Uh, so much easier for him just to go by BK. These guys seem to be calming down a little bit by the lead female. She's the one that's still a little bit kind of twitchy, but I don't see anything. I mean, I'm not seeing any movement. Could have been something like a jackal that ran through the grass, or um, a diker, or a steenbok that's just triggered them to be a little bit alert. Um, the grass here is not incredibly long, um, so I don't see why they would be kind of as, as sort of twitchy and not being able to see what it is. I would have expected them to actually be able to pick up what they're kind of looking at in this particular area. I was just scanning all the trees just to see if maybe there was something sitting in the trees. Sometimes um, a leopard goes up into a tree and the impalas kind of lose sight of where it could be. Um, it's a beautiful start to the day, as you can see. Uh, there's this kind of sun that's coming up and um, there's a bit of color in the clouds. It's, it's very, very pretty this morning. The problem with it is I think it's going to be heinously hot um, today. And poor James and Walker's think in for a bit of a sweat fest if I'm honest. Alright, well these guys look fairly alert but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little loop around the block here quickly 
just to check there's no tracks that I can see on the ground um, on the road here but maybe if we just do a little loop around to the western side of quarantine um, maybe we'll pick up something um, in that area they certainly do look incredibly um, unrelaxed good it sounds like because of the fact that we have a beautiful day and that it's quite clear that James is out already this morning and so let's send you across to him so he can say good morning Good morning, good morning, and what a way to start the day. We have started with tracking a male lion that came walking past the camp where we live. And so that's what we're going to carry on doing. I think it's moving, uh, well, I, I suspect it came through here and past the dam cam a couple of hours ago. I'm not sure if anybody spotted it there. Uh, my name is James Henry. Marvellous to have you with us. We are going to walk past the camp, so if you see some infrastructure, that's what it is. And we're going to keep going quite quickly. Please talk to us using the hashtag Wild Earth, of course, or the chat stream on YouTube or Twitch. Uh, this lion is heading down towards the dam, so maybe you can let Tristan know, FC, if he wants to really try and circle around and find him if he'd like to. He may well have reached Bufuzuk Dam already if he's carried on going. Otherwise, he could be going down south. Did he appear on the dam cam? Did anyone see him there? So he did not appear last night on the dam cam. <clears throat> he must have walked past it then. Maybe he went through the grass behind it. I'd be surprised that if he didn't pitch up there. Maybe he just walked past it quickly while it wasn't facing towards him. So that's going to be our plan. It's still relatively dark this morning, but it's certainly light enough for us to see. If a lion were to stand up out of the grass, we'd probably get a little bit of a fright. We're just going to wipe the lens. Apparently there's something in the top right corner. Oh, and um, yeah, once again, I've had to be corrected. The, I keep referring to Panicum maximum, forgetting that the grass species changed name last year. Just hang on a second. Hmm? She? Oh. There's the there's the lion. There's his head sticking up out of the out of the grass. Can you see him there, Owen? Straight ahead. Yes or no? Yes. You got him. Well done. <laughs> right. Let's get Tristan down here. Tristan, come in. The dam cam was down last night. That's why we didn't get him. Tristan, Tristan, do you copy? watching us. And he's gone to sleep. <laughs> Stations, that animal is at the junction of Twin Dams Road and the link to Gari Dam. He is lying down. Let's see if we can get another view. Just bumped into him now. So the dam cam, he walked straight past the dam cam probably a few seconds ago, a few minutes ago. So we'll just try and get another view of him. Oh, and come this side because the grass will open up. He's on the road, he's lying at the junction. Oh, he's gone, he's moved. Oh, he's down. Oh, he's down in the quarry bush there. Yeah. 
We don't want to do is frighten him off. But Tristan will come down here and get a view. So we're going to stay out in the open. We're not going to try and sneak up on him. There he is. Come over here, Ern. Pop, I think it's highly unlikely that there'll be any more lions around. He's just a male on his own. Probably dark man. If this was Blondie or... You got him there, Ern. If this was dark man, at least if it was Blondie or... Um, Mohawk, they'd have taken off on first sight of us. This chap's very relaxed around us. He is watching us, obviously. And if we go any closer, I suspect he'll move off. Yeah, sassy lion, they're potentially more dangerous just simply because they're bigger. But they are not... Yeah, that's fine. They're not by default more dangerous. Um, you know, often they'll just move off. Often they run, but because they're bigger, they are potentially more dangerous. But they're less dangerous, less potentially dangerous than something like a buffalo or an elephant. Also, we're way, we're completely in the open here, which means that he doesn't feel like he's being stalked. There we go. Oh, that's magnificent. Look at that. A male lion on foot. Oh, what a pleasure. Now, we're not going to follow him from here because if we do, we're going to make him go off into the thick bush and then the vehicles won't be able to get to him. All he's doing now is moving behind a bush so that he doesn't feel exposed to us. Sammy Jane, the main does look dark, but it's not only that, it's the fact that we it is actually still quite dark. I, when did the damn cam come back up? <laughs> That's very cool. He, he, he must have he must have come past there as it came back up. I know it was down for a long time. Oh, no, then I think we didn't have internet for a long time, so the damn prob the camera probably came up, but then we couldn't broadcast it. But he, it must have been, you know, a few minutes. Tristan, are you making your way down here? Just going to find out what Tristan's plan is. Yeah, he's moving off now. We're not going to follow up. He's just gone behind a quarry bush to the east of the dam. Sorry, west of the dam, west and south of the dam. Okay, I don't know if you want to come check around here. It's very, 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 very hard at the stall. Very, I don't know. Just listening to Tristan. I can't see anything in the grass here. I don't know if I can. Okay, copy. Yeah, we'll come and give you a hand there. We'll leave this area. I mean, I don't think this line's going to go very far. So Tristan's obviously trying to find what he's with. And so we'll go and give him a hand. I don't think he's going to rush down here because I'm not sure that that line's going to go anywhere too soon. Anyway, what a wonderful way to start your Saturday, hey? Big male lion on foot. I find. Kuna Kwanzola. 
Zoe is road. Ya yingu. Ila la kufuniwa. Yeah. So Meg saying that the dam cam was only up a few minutes before drive, just before we started. Tex, there's a mail line at the junction of Twin Dams and a link to the dam. Uh, he's just gone behind a bush. We had him on foot. I'm not sure where he is now. Just giving a, an update on the radio. We'll let Tristan do the rest of that. We'll see if we can get another view. So his two brothers would almost certainly have run off. No camo pug, I think he saw us. I don't think he smelt us. There's no wind today. And that that there is is coming out of the southeast. So I don't think he smelt us. I think he probably heard us. And then he saw us. There's nothing quite like a human being to stick out like a sore thumb. The game drives are hurrying down here now. We can't see him anymore. He'll just have moved into the thickets on the banks. Yeah. Mm. Morris saying he thinks he'll stay here the whole day. All right, let's go across to Tristan and find out what he's doing that end. Well, I was coming towards James, but just as we kind of linked you guys away, those impalas started to shout and alarm call and look as though they'd spotted something. We drove around everywhere trying to look and we checked that whole area in the grass, couldn't come up with anything. So I don't know if maybe there's something else that's lying flat in the grass there and we just missed it. Um, or if it was this lion that walked past at some point and they still are just a little bit nervous. <laughs> Um, and so the presence of a car has just triggered them to get a little bit twitchy and shout But it was kind of two different impala females that those ones that were looking so twitchy in the front They were the ones that were started shouting and kind of looking as though they could see what they were shouting at but um, Certainly didn't find anything. So I think James is going to head in that area just to go and have a little look on foot um, They might be able to to find something um, in that section um, but we'll go and kind of head off towards the lion just so we can get some decent views of that um, and try and see if we can uh, kind of have a nice sighting of that evoker. I suspect it's the dark main evoker. I'm not 100% sure, obviously. I haven't seen him, but I'm pretty sure it would be kind of his area of operation at the moment. So nice that he's around will bode well for this afternoon's affairs for maybe a roar this evening, which would be nice. Um, roaring lion's always nice. And I believe a lot of you are thinking that it is indeed Dark Man. I'm pretty sure it's him. Um, he's the one that's been hanging around of late. Um, so I suspect that not much has changed and it will be him. Although you never know. Um, Maybe one of the others has creeped up, but they seem to be preoccupied with the Nkuma Pride down um, a little bit further south. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with these evokers, is whether or not uh, we're going to see a situation where um, they're going to split and the two are going to stay down there and one up here, or um, if they're going to move southwards like the Birminghams did. Um, yeah, it's going to be, I don't know, line dynamics are all over the place at the moment. Uh, in many respects, they uh, seem to be a bit sort of muddled, and it's probably due to the fact that these lions are moving, well, particularly the Inkahuma Pride, have moved south just due to food pressure more than anything else. Um, while Juma does have things like wildebeest, lack of buffalo, and, and even general game at the moment means that that pride, of the size that it is, would be just absolutely struggling. Um, to find food here and so that pressure is maybe what's pushed them southwards 
uh, towards the Sand River where there's a little bit more food. Uh, Elizabeth, you're asking why he would stay there all day. It's because that's what lions generally do. Um, <laughs> he's probably walked through the night and now that the sun's coming up it's going to get hot shortly and once it starts to get hot then lions, you know, don't want to really have to move too much at all and so you'll find that he'll position himself in a, a place where he can um, rest in some shade and take it very very easy um, he's not going to move too much I'm almost sure of it uh, even now when James found him the only reason I think he's moved is because he's probably seen them on foot but otherwise he really probably doesn't want to actually go anywhere um, lions typically start to shut down already at this time of the day um, they know that the heat is coming and so they prep for that sometimes if there's obviously hunting opportunities or there's a territorial dispute or something like that then they'll be very active um, and continually moving during the morning um, <clears throat> but generally we find at this time of the year that the lions once that sun is starting to rise that's the end of it they begin to start um, start resting and, and kind of lying down and waiting for the heat of the day to pass and then get up in the evening again Lenny, you're asking how old Darkman is. Oh, hello, Oxpeckers. Um, so, I must just now remember all of this. He was... I'm going to say that they must be six now. Five or six, I think. Let's just go back and double check. Um, I do have the date for, for them. Um, the guys where they come from sent me all the dates but I think he's five or six I'll have to go and double check um, and make 100% sure but the problem is you start getting all these dates for all these different um, leopards and lions and they all start to merge into one you gotta kinda remember which one is which um, right I'm gonna slowly head off towards this lion he shouldn't be too far away while I do that though, let's send you across to James who's admiring the beautiful sunrise. Enjoying the beautiful sunrise. And it is very beautiful. It's quite funny how some days are easy and some days are hard, isn't it? taking pictures myself of the sunrise. <whistles> I just want to tell these anti-poaching guys they're about to walk into a lion sighting. Davabzela. Gunangalala. Gunangala Martini. Gunangala Martini. Uta Uta divonati mova. It's just the anti-poaching unit about to walk into a lion sighting. <laughs> Karen, you want to know what language I'm speaking? I'm speaking bad Shangan. It's a... or Shitsonga. Yes, it's a more formal name. Some people say Shangan is a dialect of Shitsonga. My skills at uh, the language or such that, um, well, I can't really tell the difference. That is the language of the local people out here. To people who don't speak the language, I sound fluent. To people who do speak the language, I sound, um, well, not great. Oh, I told you another lie yesterday, by the way, that I need to rectify. This signal grass, over here is not Dactyloctinium at all, it is Eurocloa. Eurocloa Mozambicense. Very poor of me. Very poor, very poor. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. 
Sorry, again. What a gorgeous morning. <laughs> Anti-poaching unit. I'm not sure. I've seen them coming through Juma quite a lot of late. And they were about to walk straight down into that sighting. Which would have been awkward. The lion suddenly would have got up and moved and the guests would not have known why. Right, Tristan has managed to find the lion again, so let's go and say hello to Dark Moon. Indeed, we have managed to find him again. He is, um, well, doing what lions do best, which is having a sleep already. Um, <laughs> he's uh, obviously had a long night of moving around, and given that he's got a sore paw and limps a little bit, maybe that's why he's just feeling a little sorry for himself and, and tired and has kind of slept already. Often you find normally with the, <laughs> at this time of the day their heads are at least up, but he is out or, um, and passed off sleeping early today, which means that, like I said, I don't think he's going to go anywhere. The only problem he's going to have is that he is going to get some sunshine shortly, which is going to be incredibly hot for him. And so he is going to move at some point to a little bit of shade, but he won't move far. Um, he'll move maybe, I don't know, five, ten meters and then lie down again. Um, so I don't think he's going to go a long way. But it intrigues me, his movements. Um at the moment and it intrigues me how he kind of goes about things. Um, Tracy you're asking why it's always on his own but I, I mean it kind of ties into what I was just about to say is that um, the reason he's on his own is that the, the two other evokers seemingly have attached themselves to the Nkuma Pride. They've mated with the Nkuma Pride and um, there's cubs there and so they now are spending a lot of time um, where the Nkuhuma Pride is, and, um, often hearing reports of them together with the Nkuhumas, um, and so that's what's dragged them south. Darkman, on the other hand, is is up in the north because of the fact that he's got cubs with the Talamati Pride, um, and so he spends a lot, vast sort of majority of his time kind of bouncing, I suppose, um, between the Talamatis and then coming south here, probably in, in search of his coalition partners and so that's why he's often on his own is that his area and the females that he's mated with and the pride that he's a kind of side offspring with is hanging out much further north than the pride that the other two have side offspring with um, and so that's why they maybe have pushed a little bit further south and there's this kind of split that's taking place at the moment um, what you'll find is if the Nkumas come back up into this area then we should see these guys together a lot more um, the problem is, is as time goes, um, the the longer the period is that they are apart, the more you're going to find that these guys are going to potentially um, be less tolerant of each other, which is um, obviously not ideal. So um, they uh, could then potentially kind of fight with one another, which is weird bloody um yeah he does actually look pretty skinny um you probably find he's been walking a lot since we last saw him and i haven't heard of any kills that the talamatis have been on or anything like that and given that he is only obviously uh, a male lion by himself hunting is not easy at the moment a lot of the prey animals are fit and healthy and strong um and so that makes life a little bit more tricky it seems that the guys are just wanting to shuffle around here, so I'm just going to wait for everybody to move and kind of do their thing. Um, but maybe that's why he just hasn't had a decent meal. Um, a lot of the time that he's feeding, he's going to be feeding off um, the the kind of, not scraps, but the, the success of the Talamati pride. And so um, I'm pretty sure he just hasn't really been kind of eating that well over the last few days but in saying that male lions often look like this um, a lot of people always think that male lions are big fat and healthy um, they can sometimes be fairly slender um, and their bodies can look like that 
Um, so yeah, it's just he's not in any way un, in an unhealthy condition. It's just that he hasn't had a, a meal in a few days. Um, but one big carcass, so something like a buffalo or a giraffe or something like that, and he'll look fat and full again. But typical lion um, puts his head up and flops back down. He is in no mood to be walking around anywhere at this stage of the game. Um, the reason the guys are leaving the sighting actually at the moment is because the dogs have just been found. Not on Juma, they're just slightly north of the boundary at the moment, but I'm pretty sure they are going to come onto Juma at some point, which will be nice. I'm going to just move forward for you, BK, so that we can get a slightly better view with this grass that is protruding out everywhere. And maybe we can actually just see his face a little bit. That'll be nice. Hello, boy. Haley, you're asking if we're disturbing the lion by being close. Um, well, no, not really. Um, the movement of the cars just now is what's woken him up. Um, so the car is kind of driving and, and moving around, and uh, that's why he's woken up. But you'll find that his demeanor is not one of an unrelaxed animal. When lions or leopards or any sort of cat is unrelaxed and is feeling disturbed one is it's going to try and get away from you and it's going to try and move as you can see with him he is in no way trying to do any of that in fact he is now fast asleep um, his eyes are closed the second thing is that they will not lie on their sides like that when they are disturbed and they feel as though they're being pressured they have a demeanor where they'll kind of get their back legs underneath their body and their paws forward um, and that's so that they can move and they can have a fight or flight response. Either they're going to be aggressive towards you to then try and say, please back off, or they're going to run away. Um, and you can see that he is in no way doing either of those. Um, and so our position that we're in right now um, really is basically negligent to him. As long as the engine's off, if I had to turn the engine on and leave it running, that would start to irritate him and he wouldn't probably like it very much. Um, but if I have my engine off and we sit quietly and we speak quietly like we are now, you can see this lion is now gone to sleep, his eyes are closed. Um, he is pretty happy with us being where we are. So um, it's all about kind of reading the lang body language of the animal. If he was showing any signs of distress, then we would be much further away. And even then, um, if it's proper distress, we, would, we wouldn't even actually view him. We would just leave him, and, and, and he probably wouldn't even allow us to view him. He would move into places where we just couldn't get to him. Um, so when an animal is lying like this and it is as relaxed as this, then, I mean, there's, there's no need to worry about anything. Um, certainly not kind of disturbing him. What will be disturbing him is more than us at this stage is the flies. And you can see them landing every now and then around his eye area. It's why his eye is moving the way it is and um, blinking. Um, those flies are trying to get the moisture around his eye. And I can show you that there are a lot of flies this morning. Um, so it's highly irritating. Africa Addicted Girl, you're asking why their heads are bigger than their body. Well, um... Their body is not small. Um, he's just at the moment obviously not full, but when they've got um, a huge big tummy, then their heads look in proportion to their body. It's just when they look, when they get a little bit on the skinny side, um, they look a bit funny because um, their manes and their kind of head size looks as though it's sort of disproportionate to the rest of them. Um, but remember with these guys that their front ends are the areas that they use in order to be able to establish themselves as territorial individuals. Um, to be able to bring down large prey animals like buffalo and so they have to have power in that front end and so if you look at the paws you look at the shoulders you look at the head it's all bigger than the back end and that's because it needs to be powerful to be able to do what I've just described whereas the back end is there to try and provide the speed element for these guys when they're hunting so sl more slender longer legs um, to be able to run quickly um, to to you know catch food whereas the front end is all to defend itself um, attack and, and be able to pin down big animals as well as obviously to um, 
be a weapon for territorial purposes as well. Right, now he's going to be probably very sleepy, so we'll sit here a little while longer. We'll see there's some impalas around. Let's just see if he maybe wakes up for us and gives us a nice view again. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to James, who's ambling about. There's nothing quite as much, that, uh, or nothing that irritates Tristan quite as much as a big fat lion doing absolutely nothing. So I don't suppose we'll be there for the whole drive, which I think is a good thing. Here we've got some lovely pictures of netwing beetles. And they are backlit by the recently risen sun. And we've come into the area where Tristan had those impala earlier today. And maybe we shall come up with something else. Maybe the rest of the pride is lying in this long grass. Maybe it was leopard. Maybe it was absolutely nothing. Who knows? Who knows? Not me. It's an amazing profusion of netwing beetles. Most impressive. And I don't know if you can hear in the background. I suspect, unfortunately, that you can't. But there's the sound of the quails. Isn't that cool? Amazing to have them backlit like that in the gorgeous spear grass and the heteropogon contortus. I suppose that name's changed as well, has it? I got that wrong? I don't think it has. I think it's the same as it always was. Hmm. Ziggerty, you're wondering about fireflies in South Africa. Absolutely, we get fireflies and glowworms here. Uh, we get them in this particular area as well. I haven't seen many this season. Well, not here anyway. I've seen them in the Eastern Cape. At Christmas time, we had them there. Uh, just a few, not many. But yeah, we do get definitely get them. They're a fascinating group of insects that are able to make cool light that um, we, as far as I'm aware, as human beings have yet to be able to replicate effectively. So it's a particularly energetically uh, efficient process of creating light. And there's a, there's a chemical in the body of the insect called luciferin, and this is used um, or under the action of luciferase, it oxidizes to and gives off um, gives off light, and it's a reversible reaction. So luciferase can make the reaction go both ways, and so the firefly or glowworm doesn't use up all of its fuel quickly. Uh, and so it's a very efficient way of making light. It's cool. It's not hot at all. There are a number of suspicions around those particular animals and one of them is that if they touch your eyes you'll go blind and I've told this story before but I remember I was doing some training with a chap once a local guy and we were getting on fine you know he was doing really well and we were driving one evening we had a wonderful sort of training drive and we were on the Timbavati River and I went, drove down into the river and there were these fireflies all over the place and I was waxing lyrical about how beautiful they are and how the process works and I looked next to me and there the guy was sitting like this and I said what are you doing he said well if they touch your eyes you go blind so I said no you won't go blind the chances of them touching your eyes are tiny anyway but to promise you you won't go blind nothing I could say would dissuade this man that he wasn't about to go blind and we just had to leave. He stopped looking at them, or he wouldn't look at them. 
And that was that. So unfortunately, although he became a guide and a very good one, I don't suppose his guests ever got to enjoy the, the pleasures of watching glowworms or fireflies. Valentino is saying fireflies are on the decline in his area because of light pollution. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me, Valentino. I suppose they're on the decline everywhere. Seven and a half billion of us and counting. Now, we begin again the process of trying to uncover the multitude of species of butterfly that we find here. He should be relatively easy to find. The trouble is, you need to know what family he belongs to before you kind of start looking, because otherwise it's a bit difficult. I'm not even going to ask James Richard, because I know that he's already on the job. All right, let's try and figure this out. While we do that, let's go back to the lion before he really goes completely asleep. I'm afraid it's too late, James. He is already completely asleep. Bar the odd fly landing on his eye, um, there is zero movement from uh, Dark Mane. He is, uh, yes, out for the count at this stage. Um, he's doing what, what lions do best, which is have a good nap. Um, but there are some, like I say, some prey animals not too far away from us. There's some wildebeest, there's some impalas. I don't think, however, they're going to head in this direction. Generally, what we find with wildebeest and impalas, of, of quarantine in particular, is that they don't come down towards the drainage line. So they might come down to drink at the dam or at the pans, um, and they might mill about the open clearing just around the dam cam, but they very seldom move in this direction towards the, the actual drainage. It's too thick and dense here, particularly for wildebeest. Um, and so they try and avoid it as much as possible. But maybe they're going to make a bit of noise and they're going to make a, a kind of um, a grunt or something like that. And that might um, basically wake this male up and he might look in that. area um, but apparently it's not really the, the case I mean while it obviously is going to soften a blow um, all right so it sounds like unfortunately you guys didn't hear what I was saying um, so basically uh, it was initially always thought that um, a lion's mane was there for protection for when they fight um, it uh, was, you know, around the chest and neck area. Um, it's not really the case. Um, while it does probably soften the blow, um, if there's a bite or a, or a um, you know, a flying paw or something like that, it's not going to really make that much of a difference. And also when male lions fight, they try and to target the back ends of each other rather than actually the front ends. Um, and so it it might serve a little bit of a purpose for that, but its real kind of purpose is to show maturity and to show a dominance. Um, when a male lion has a big mane that is dark and black, um, it means that this individual is in prime. Um, and so it sends a very clear signal to younger males as well as um, females that this is a male that is able to cope with this mane. Um, if it's dark, obviously that attracts heat and it's uncomfortable, but it's also a sign that this male is able to, to still handle himself and to be able to survive with this big kind of dark mane. And so they reckon that the, the darker it is, the more attractive it is to females uh, and the more that, you know, females will, will potentially mate with them. So it's more that than anything else. Um, it's a sign of, of, like I say, dominance and, and adulthood. Um, in the lion world, so intimidating to other lions and obviously attracting um, female lions. Um, 
his mane is is nice. It's still got a little bit of growth to go, um, particularly on top. Um, but he he does still have a beautiful mane, and it's definitely starting to darken up. And he's got nice little tufts on his front legs, which is also quite cool. Um, Elizabeth, um, so yes and no. Um, and I'll tell you why now. It really depends on what they're hunting. So in the case of hunting something like buffalo, male lions are just as capable as what females are. They are incredibly powerful. They bring down their own animals regularly, um, especially coalitions. Uh, you know, if you look at the Birmingham's when they first arrived here, they were hunting buffalo regularly as a group of males only. Um, so they are very capable of hunting um, on their own. Where their problem is is that unfortunately being bigger than lionesses and having a mane means that they often get spotted a lot easier than what the lionesses do and so that means that certain hunting is a little bit more tricky for them um, and also then anything that is fast is difficult for them so if they're hunting something like impalas it's really not easy for a male lion because of his bulk and his size he just doesn't have the same agility and speed as what a lioness does and so hunting smaller faster antelope really is difficult for these guys so they're more the power game um, you could probably compare them to sort of um, shot putters versus um, and, the, and the, the ladies being more kind of sprinters in, in if you want to look at it that way I mean they're still powerful but they um, maybe a 400 meter athlete um, but these uh, the males are more these kind of heavyweight, strong, um, and they're able to bring down big animals like baby elephants and buffalo and, and the likes, and so are very useful in that and are very good at hunting those. Um, but uh, in, when it comes to sort of faster, more agile prey, a little bit more tricky for them. Um, but that's why I say they, the male lions, they have this bad reputation that they aren't able to hunt, that the females do all the work. That's not true. Male lions do hunt and, and are very capable hunters. Um, it's just a little bit more tricky for them to, to stalk and those kinds of things because of the mane. Um, but these coalitions survive, a lot of them, um, on their own for weeks and weeks at a time. Um, and they, so they are able to bring down food items and I've even seen them hunt things like impalas and, and the likes but it's it's tricky for them and they've got to get quite lucky when they do hunt those kinds of things. Alright, he's still fast asleep at the moment. I'm going to try and get an update on the dogs and see if they're starting to come towards the boundary. It sounds like they're just north of the boundary at Sydney's Dam. Um, so um, once I've got an update there then we'll decide whether we're going to leave him or not. But in the meantime, back across to James. James Richard took for roughly five seconds to identify that butterfly. It was a two-pip policeman. I obviously checked to make sure that um, it was, in fact, true. And, uh, as always, it was, in fact, true. A two-pip policeman. So the policemen have got that brownish wing. I only know this now. Brown wing plus the white stripe. And that one had two little pips on it. So it was a two-pip policeman. Very nice name. Got a nice picture of it. I shall post it at some stage. A two-pip policeman. Very good. Thank you for that, James. Again. Minamu. Uh, beetles. Do they help or hinder the environment? Beetles are part of an intricate and infinitely complex ecosystem. Remember, there are thousands of species of beetle, thousands and thousands of species of beetle. And so to, uh, to ask whether they hinder or help the environment is not, it's actually impossible to answer. They are such an integral part of the environment that to remove them from it would create a huge change. And Yes, you really can't think of it in binary terms like that. They have benefits to some creatures. They are predators to other creatures. So a ground beetle is a predator. I'm sure if you were to ask termites and other smaller beetles 
whether they thought ground beetles were a hindrance to the environment, they'd say absolutely yes, they do think that they are. In the same way that if you were to ask Impala if they thought lions were a hindrance to the environment, they'd say yes, for sure, they are certainly a hindrance. So it really does depend on your perspective. In terms of overall balance, uh, and I use the term advisedly, obviously, knowing that there is no such thing as natural balance or harmony. Uh, you know, beetles are an ancient, ancient group of creatures, and there's so many of them performing so many functions out here that without them, things would change profoundly. Now, whether you think that that's good or bad, uh, that would be subjective. So, to have, to take a position, hindrance or uh, help, is to take a a very subjective kind of right or wrong um, position on it, and you really can't do that in biology. It's just a, it's a case of what would the effects be if they weren't around. Do you know what I mean? The environment would be profoundly different. Would it be good or bad? Well, that depends entirely on who you are and what your perspective is. Yes, KFC, there are many databases for butterflies in Africa. Uh, the app that I use, the butterfly app that I use, and I'm assuming James Richard uses as well, obviously a lot more effectively than I do, is called The Butterflies of South Africa. Steve Woodall's Butterflies of South Africa, that's the one I use, and it's really good. There are a lot of butterfly books out that were really hard to use. I always found them almost impossible to find any butterfly in, but this app is pretty good. The only problem with an app is that you can't flick quickly through pages. You can't sort of, you know, it takes, it, it helps if you know what family you're looking at. Because there's so many different species. There's a nice frog app as well, but with frogs it's much easier because there are only 30 or 40 species that you'd expect to find here, which means you can flip through all of them and get an idea. <laughs> Liz, you want to see a dung beetle today? I haven't seen many for a while, actually. I don't know why that should be the case. It's probably because there hasn't been a lot of dung around. Not a lot of elephants. So all the dung is being made by the impalas and that sort of thing, and that's inside the bush. And that's why we're not seeing the dung beetles. But yeah, um, yeah we'll try and find that. All right, let's go back to Tristan. He's decided not to leave his lion just yet. No, we haven't left our lion. Unfortunately, there's just too many cars um, with the dogs at the moment. They're running around all over the place right at the gate. So there's cars from the west and yeah, from our side as well. So we've just decided to stay with this line for a little bit. I'm just trying to see that now that the sun's coming up, if once it hits him, he decides to maybe wake up. At least we had a poor move there. That's the sum total of the movement that we've seen um, since he flopped back down earlier. Um, he otherwise has not, he's been motionless. Um, so I don't think he's going to be too active this morning. But like I say, once the sun gets up, maybe it gets a little bit warm on him and particularly because they have that mane, they get hot quite quickly and then they try and seek out shade. Um, and there's lots of nice shade very close by here, so I'm pretty sure he'll just kind of wander into that and, and have a little lie down. But like I said, it bodes well for this evening more so than this morning. Um, if he's still around this evening, then it's very likely that we're going to see him uh, roaring or potentially, you know, vocalizing, um, which is is going to be very, very nice. Uh, the other night of typical Murphy's Law, when we had him, um, we kind of wanted him to roar, and he didn't really do anything, and literally we wrapped the show, and two minutes later he was roaring, of course. Um, so tonight I'm hoping that his timing is a little bit better, and we'll get him roaring this evening. Um, not so much for my sake, because I'm going to be... Um, out uh, this afternoon. I'm no longer going to be on drive. Um, although I am still at Juma, I've got guests coming in 
to Tumbeta today, so I'm going to be guiding out of there. Um, but, uh, yeah, Steve and James, well, I'm sure will be happy to to have him around. I think James is driving this afternoon, so um, I'm sure James will spend some time with him around sunset. Let's, um, uh, depends, I suppose, where you are. I mean, the Mara of the Lions hunt regularly during the day. Saw many, many hunts um, during the day. Um, here in this particular area, yeah, mostly mostly at night that they uh, are are hunting um, and trying to find food. Um, you know, it gets. I suppose in the winter months you do see them hunting during the day here, but generally it's so warm um, in summer that it's not great but they're opportunistic as well so if there really is something that comes along so let's say he's sitting here and an injured buffalo walks past I mean he's not gonna not hunt it because it's hot and um, he'll try and take any sort of a chance he gets and so I mean it's it's one of those things where they they are opportunistic but the height of their hunting activity or their kind of where they actually go looking for food generally is in the the cooler um, darker hours which I suppose makes them kind of nocturnal hunters more than diurnal hunters, but they will hunt in the day if, if opportunity presents itself. Um, in the Mara, it's far more common though than it is here. You know, Mu, you're asking why these lions, or male lions in particular, have more injuries on their legs. Um, it's generally because of the way that they go about their business. Um, they normally are in forces around carcasses and um, that means that they come in with force and, and often females then kind of have to back away and there's sometimes altercation with that um, but more so than anything else is that male lines typically in a, and a lot of the male lines we've watched are coalition lines and coalition lines means that the boys fight all the time whether it be over females or food and you can imagine when two male lines have a go at each other it becomes quite serious quite quickly um, and so those injuries on the legs are often given to them by their own kind um, so by their, their coalition partners or because of the fact that they hunt big animals generally they hunt things like buffalo and giraffe there's injuries that they pick up from hunting those big animals uh, it's a physical thing for a lion to bring down a buffalo particularly now I mean the, the lions are going to struggle with buffalo after the rains that we've had the buffalo are going to be fit healthy and strong um, and so then there's injuries that take place there um, so it's pretty much part and parcel of a male lion's life at some point in his life he's going to end up limping and that's going to be like I say either an altercation with another male lion or um, with a big prey animal um, or even prides that gang up on him. Um, so he's not a male lion if he doesn't have a few cuts and scrapes and um, a limp every now and then. That's just part of, of how they roll. Uh, um, they they live a pretty hard existence, do, do lions. Um, it might look very regal and it might look like they don't do much um, when they're sleeping like this, but their existence is not an easy one. Um, their tenure is a dominant force is short um, and constantly being challenged and so you know they've got to be a bit careful about how they go about life and like I say every now and then that leads to a little leg injury here and there the females are far more kind of subservient when it comes to to fighting like that over carcasses and things like that they're not going to risk getting injured um, because that might then risk the the ability for their cubs to survive um, so you find that they typically don't limp as much because they don't really get involved um, in skirmishes and, and things like that. But they too also can catch, um, you know, a flying paw from a male or bite or, you know, get injured in a hunter as well. So you do see females limping from time to time, um, but the males more so. Now, Graham, you're asking how fast lion can run. Um, so, female will be doing about 70 to 80 kilometers an hour. So, what would that be? Between sort of 50 and 60 miles, um, if my math is correct. Um, whereas, uh, the males 
a little bit slow. I mean, they probably just kind of push 70. Their bulk and their size makes life a little bit tricky for them to, to get up to the same speed as the females. Um, yeah, so they're slightly slower, but still quick, all things considered. And you think that these are 150 to 250 kilogram animals that are being propelled around at that speed. It's ridiculous. All right, I think we're going to stay here for a little while longer, and that's why, because I was about to say that the wildebeest are starting to creep a little bit closer, and the sun is starting to hit him, and so maybe we we're going to get a little bit of action out of him. Um, now that he's popped his head up, if you don't mind, Natalie, we're just going to have a stay with him for a little bit. He might decide to move. Um, but you can see he's kind of just watching up towards the wildebeest at the moment. They're slowly kind of coming down the hill towards the pan, um, and so let's just see what he actually gets up to. Um, it's the reason why I wanted to actually stay here. And so poor James, who was about to do a, a segment, um, I'm afraid you're going to have to just wait a little bit, James. I mean, it's not like it's crazy exciting, um, but it's just nice to kind of have his head up a little bit. What I might do, BK, do you want me to go back a bit or you're all right where we are? Okay, we're all right for now. BK's happy, so that's good. But you can see he's watching those wildebeest and it's what I was saying to you earlier with the hunting during the day is opportunity is everything if these wildebeest wander too close he certainly will try his luck um, to grab one um, but you know the, the, he's gonna have to be incredibly lucky and I would be very surprised if the wildebeest come to where we are now I suspect that they're just going to hang around right in the center of that open area doesn't look like he's really in a stalking mode he's just kind of watching at this stage um, so when they have their heads up like this they're kind of just looking if he was into a proper stalk you'd find that his back legs would come up underneath his tummy um, and his head will go forward and his ears will flatten down a little bit and his kind of muzzle will be pushed out and that's when they're in a situation where they're going to be trying to kind of hunt down whatever is close by the moment is more just he's gazing and kind of watching and just seeing whether or not it's worth the effort to try and actually um, hunt these guys. Hello, boy. A oh, little bit of light in his eye is beautiful. It's a shame he's being driven mad. You can see how he's constantly blinking the whole time, and that's just because of the flies that are landing around his eyes. Um, we also having the exact same problem. The flies all over us this morning, so um, not comfortable. Do you want to go back a bit? So he get wants to go back just slightly. So let's just go back a little bit for you. Him. I pity this long grass is just going to be in his muzzle area. But maybe if we just get into that position there. It's a little bit better. We've got a better view of his kind of face and um, we can actually see him in nice detail. But What's amazing with these guys is you forget just how big male lions are. Um, you know, especially in this part of the world we spend so much time with leopards in particular. Um, and you know, a leopard is a big animal and spending time with Tingana the, and the other day, um, when you see the size of this guy in comparison it's just unbelievable. He is monstrous, um, particularly his head and his front paws um, in comparison. All right, he's gone flat again, so now we can um, send you off to James. Um, if he is still ready, Natalie, I'm not sure if he is. Um, just let me know, and um, hopefully James won't be too um, upset. But no... No, no, Natalie, you got wrong comms. You go. He's not going to know that you. He's live. <laughs> so they got the wrong radio comms. Um, hopefully James knows that he's live. Now we can send you across to him. Right now we're live. Okay. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Again. 
and just got stuck in a tree there. Um, we're now sort of heading down towards the south. We didn't find anything around where Tristan saw the impala looking upset. My conclusion is that those impala saw the lion walk past. He must have walked past our camp probably five minutes before we went live. So I think that's what they were looking uneasy about. And we haven't found any further tracks of any other predator. So that's going to be our conclusion. We'll head now down towards the south, towards sort of Treehouse Dam area, and see what we can find in that region. Perhaps some more insecta. No doubt some more insects, most of which we won't be able to identify because there are so many of them. Um, Anna Marie, it really depends, again, on each bug and each butterfly. Some of them will last almost into winter, and others will disappear fairly soon. I'm trying to think of some that last a bit longer than the others. The broad-bordered grass yellows, those ones that you find on the elephant dung, the little yellow ones, will probably disappear relatively soon. There's one sitting on that Waltheria plant there. Come over here, and you'll get him. Yeah. You got him. They'll disappear fairly soon. Um, I suspect most of those blues and things will also disappear relatively soon. And some of the bigger ones, the acreas and the monarchs, will probably last a bit longer. I remember last year we had quite a nice walk through the Mdawamati, way at the bottom. Can you see him? He's that bright yellow thing there. Yeah, now he's flown away. You got him. Um, and then the dung beetles obviously go as soon as the ground gets hard, the dung beetles disappear. Uh, the, some of the stink bugs lasted well into May last year. So, re, you know, anime does depends. And the termites, of course, will keep going pretty much consistently all year round. Um, Elizabeth flies play a lot of different roles. Remember, again, when we talk about flies, we're not talking about one species. We're talking about hundreds of different species of fly. Robber flies are predators, uh, some flies are parasites, some flies are very important for cleaning stuff up, so they lay their eggs in meat, which then goes on, or the eggs go on to hatch into maggots, which clean up meat and they help uh, keep disease away. Some flies spread disease, so it really does depend on the fly species. Um, I think what's, uh, I mean, mosquitoes are flies. Again, I, I don't. I've, I've never managed to quite clearly um, explain what I'm going to now. I haven't managed to find the correct words for what I'm going to say now. One shouldn't think of it in terms of what role an animal plays in the ecosystem so much as thinking about what niche an animal occupies. So what what niche is there for an animal to occupy that it then filled? Because, I mean, when you, when you start thinking of it like that, it starts making much more sense from an evolutionary perspective. When you start, oh, there's another policeman. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a car coming, so we're going to have to get out of the way. When you start thinking of it from the t point of view of what role does an animal play, you start thinking it from it as a very top-down kind of design where there's been a design of a sort of grand master plan around nature and different things have been placed into different roles whereas it's actually flipped around a bit if you think of it as growing from uh, organically and different creatures just eking out a niche and pushing themselves into a niche that's a much more accurate picture of what's happened out here. So when you look at flies, uh, especially 
for creatures you don't like, like flies, like these beastly biting flies. Um, they do have, I suppose, a role. They have, in so much as they're part of the food chain, um, they probably create a bit of disease and death for some creatures, that sort of stuff. But actual fact, in actual fact, when you're thinking about what their function is, you need to think about their niche. So what niche do they fill? And how are they able to fill that niche? Because when you talk about a role, it almost sounds as if it's inevitably positive, that there must be some positive effect that it has. And what it's not positive or negative, it just is. If you know what I mean? You see what I mean? I get, I get, um, I haven't quite managed to find the way to say that in a concise fashion yet. Here is a disgusting looking worm. Now, oops, I think it's dead. I think it's dead. Now, I'm pretty sure this is definitely an insect larva, and I'm pretty sure it's a beetle larva of some description. And it's drowned. It has been unable to swim thing and would probably have been a ground beetle or some such there we are consulting detective you said makes sense that no species is there to uh, help another species yeah that's correct it might end up helping the other species but it hasn't been um, designed to do so necessarily they only do things uh, you know, animals live for the benefit of themselves as individuals, not even as species. And that um, can either be beneficial or harmful to other creatures. It just depends on who they are. This is the kind of basics of ecology, and it's, it's interesting thinking, and it's important thinking, because it really does inform how we interact with nature. Oh, my goodness. It's quarter to seven, and that lion is actually moving. He is, but only because he's hot. Um, he's been lying in the sun, and that's why he's now starting to move. You can see he's kind of just limping his way to where there's going to be some decent shade and then he'll flop himself back down I'm pretty sure so the reason we stayed with him was purely in the hope that he would do this um, if he flops back down in the shade there then we're going to probably um, leave him be which I'm pretty sure he's about to do there we go <laughs> So we're going to go try and see what else we can find. Um, I just wanted to wait until he stood up. He's not going to move if, until the sun hits him again. Um, the fact that he hasn't moved for the wildebeest that are around and the way he's just kind of flopped down now means that he's in no way interested in this morning's affairs. So it's fine. He's welcome to be that way. I think let's go up towards Bufusuk Dam and see if there's any sign of Columba anywhere around. I would wonder where the dogs went. They seem they've lo like they've lost them at the moment. Um, seems like they maybe have gone somewhere um, into Buffalo's Hook again, which is quite odd. I thought they were going west at one point into Gary Gate area, but you wouldn't even know there's a male line here now. I suppose I should let everyone know that I'm actually leaving the sighting. I'll do it just now. I wonder if our terrapins are on their log today. Excuse me. Yes, they are. I'll stop here for now because otherwise they will bomb off into the water. But there we go. That's the terrapin log. Uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying this log and the fact that these terrapins all line up on it to get some sun um, in the mornings and even in the afternoons actually you find them here as well but they spend their time kind of lining up and then from there they do these little plops 
into the water when they feel like they are um, being disturbed. Although these guys look as though they're okay. I think we parked far enough not to worry, maybe not. Are you going to go over the edge, little terrapin? <laughs> it's very true. This, um, this uh, terrapin does have a feather in its cap. You can see there's a feather stuck to its shell um, on top of its carapace. Um, silly, silly, silly terrapin. They're funny creatures, aren't they? What's also quite interesting is we actually have a banded groundling sitting on our um, on our bonnet. So our um, our bonnet is uh, probably fairly warm. I don't know why. It, maybe they it's why it's sitting there. But I would have thought it would have flown off by now. But it's pretty happy just taking it easy. Cool, isn't it? Obviously, he likes our bonnet. Um, I'm like I say, surprised it's not burning its feet. That bonnet gets incredibly hot um, when we've been driving around. I suppose we haven't been driving around too much this morning, and so it's able to kind of withstand any sort of heat that there actually is there. But it's probably drying its wings a little bit as well. You can see how the wings are kind of. Um, uh, sort of angling its wings downwards in the direction of the light to almost um, kind of dry them out before it will carry on. Dory, you're asking if those are wormholes in the tree with the terrapins. Uh, no. Um, a wormhole would be something um, in outer space. Um, those like little markings and things you're seeing there um, are from probably what's known as a borer beetle. Um, borer beetles are something that we see a lot of out here, um, particularly in dead trees. You get these small little holes that develop in um, the, the wood, and that's basically this tunneling little larvae that goes in there um, and basically processes um, the dread and what rotting wood. Um, Maybe why this tree, although this tree looks like it's fallen at the roots, but um, leadwood is something that you don't often actually see borer beetles on because it's so hard. Um, but every now and then you'll get those little holes that will develop from it. All right. Donna, so terrapin, tortoise, and turtle. Um, it's something that a lot of people don't really. Um, understand and, and so the easiest way to, to differentiate between them is that a terrapin like we're seeing now is semi-aquatic so it spends its time in water and on land a turtle spends its time in water only and it only comes onto land to nest um, and a tortoise spends its time only on um, land and only goes to water to drink um, so that would be the kind of way to remember it. So terrapins um, do swim around, come onto land and bathe and move about as well. So they have the best of both. Whereas um, turtles, water, tortoise, land. That's the best way to, to remember it. Um, there are other subtle differences between them, but um, it's the easiest and, and most concise way is basically like that. Um, most tortoises would try and avoid going into areas where they would have to swim and most uh, turtles will try and avoid being on land where they have to walk. Alright guys, we're going to leave you. Um, shame, they have a tough day. The weavers are very, very noisy um, next to them. But I hope none of them are going to go plopping into the water again. It makes me giggle when um, we do. Our banded groundling doesn't want to leave us. It's still sitting on our bonnet even with us driving, which is pretty ridiculous how oh, there it goes. Uh, now it's moving on. Okay, we're going to carry on. We're going to probably just make a turn up towards Buffalzik Dam. In the meantime though, let's send you back across to James. Hello again. We 
just walking very slowly down through here, we heard this strange sound, Morris and I, going... Mm. Mm. We don't know what it is, so we're going to go and look. It's quite far, and it doesn't seem to have carried on. I'm just going to stop now, listen... Seems to have stopped. While Morris has a look there, um, Megan, who's in the final control the other day, asked what the purpose of brush packing is. And, well, Megan, here is the purpose of brush packing. So this used to be the old road, or a fire break. I'm not sure exactly what, but it was an exposed piece of soil. And what they did was they chopped up a whole lot of black monkey thorn, not black monkey thorn, black monkey orange, and put the sticks on this particular piece of road. And what it did was to catch the soil, stop it eroding, and also catch the seeds that were in the soil and stop it eroding when the rain came. And that gave a chance for the seeds to germinate. They've germinated and they've now stabilized the area and eventually the brush packing will rot away as all wood does and it would just be kind of grass so next here's a really nice example of brush packing we'll just walk down here and see if we can't hear the sound again I think it was maybe a young wildebeest or a young impala. Can't hear it now. Angela, yes, there are a few natural insect repellents, such as the wild garlic, but the smell of the wild garlic is very unpleasant. Uh, you can use some of the sort of more spicy things, like um, wild aniseed, etc. But they too, um, you know, they start to get in your nose a bit. There's a vehicle stopped up there, and we haven't heard anything on the radio. Just keep going down here for now. It would be nice if we came across the rest of the pride on a kill. I'm sure we'd have seen some tracks by now. That's going to happen. Anyway, let's have a look at this elephant dung while we wait to find out. Oh, goodness gracious me. So stiff today. what this elephant is eating. I must say, I'm quite surprised that there aren't dung beetles here. And there are no dung beetles having a go at it either, so I'm not too worried about breaking it open. I don't know why there shouldn't be. Now, I don't know if you're able to see this. Apparently there's a dung beetle next to me. Is there? inside the mound closest to me. Not this thing here. Not that thing there. Closer to my thigh. In the forefront. Am I going mad? next to my knee. I mean, there is a beetle, but it's most certainly not 
a beetle that was seen before. I'd hate to think... Are we sure it was a beetle and not a marula pip? Anyway, there's one small beetle in here. It is a dung beetle of some description. Um, but I would have expected to find a lot of dung beetles here. So what we can see is that the elephant has been eating a lot of grass. Huge amounts of grass. Very little in the way of trees. But it is still picking up the odd piece of wood, as you can see there, from that stick. Although that looks more... No, it's not. That's a grass stolon. It's not a stick at all. So this particular dung ball is almost exclusively grass. There's a little stick there. But most of it's grass. And that's just because grass is easier to digest and there are a lot of protein-rich grasses around at the moment because of the amount of water that there is. So I wouldn't normally do this because I would disturb a lot of beetles and things. <coughs> Owen is just coughing up a lung. All right there, Owen? Yes. He's okay. But, you know, the only beetle is that one there. And he looks like he might be dead. He looks almost like he may have been eaten and passed through the elephant's digestive system. No, no, this wasn't the beetle. I uncovered this beetle well after you said you saw a beetle. Oh, my goodness. Someone in the FC is spoiling for a fight. I can't find the other one, if there was one. Anyway, there it is. Let's turn him over like that. He'll be fine there. And wonder to ourselves why it is that there aren't a great number of dung beetles that have come into the area, spread the stuff around. Uh, no, MGN, why would it bother me that there's dung on the roads? Not sure why it would bother me. Uh, the reason there's so much on the roads is that the elephants like to use the roads, as do all the animals, so for the same reasons that we like to use the roads, it's just easier for them to move. It's quite, um, well, you know, rough walking through the bush. Ticks and things, things tearing at your legs. It's un just uncomfortable. All righty. Oh. Okay. All right, the reason that everyone stopped down there is that there are some of those things that we don't speak about. Here's a butterfly. It's a brown. It's one of the browns. It is, if you come over here, you'll get a nice view of it. Let me see if I can identify it before James Richard can tweet it. I bet he knows what it is already, but he hasn't tweeted it yet. Yeah, be slow with the camera. Be very slow with the camera so I can get a head start. Good idea. Come on. Uh, I'm now having an absolute nightmare with the... with the, um... <laughs> with the app... You got him. Dash. Has he moved? No, he hasn't. All right, let's see. No. 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 No, 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 no. 
Yeah, that's exactly right, Usain. You say the spots look like mini eyes. That's exactly what they're intended to look like. Hmm. I can't find this chap, naturally. It's not unusual. Being savaged by flies. Let me get a bit closer to him. He's got lots of spots. Hmm. Oh, that looks a bit closer. Maybe one of the ringlets, which is one of the browns. Uh, nope. Nope. I'm having a, an, a fail. I suspect James has gone to bed. Sick and tired of doing my job for me. Uh, could be it. A grizzled bush brown? Mm. A grizzled bush brown, maybe. Mm. I think so, though. Yeah, grizzled bush brown is the closest I can get. I have no doubt that the rest of you are sick and tired of watching me do this, so we shall wait for James Richard to confirm or deny. Oh, and then there's a spider next to him. Come and have a look here. Yeah, thankfully he's gone. Oh, he can't embarrass me any further. There's the spider. It looks like one of the hairy field spiders. OK, we're not going to look at the spider. We're going to go over to Tristan. We're not going to go over to Tristan. We're going to stay with the spider a moment longer. I think that the spider is... Yeah, it looks like a hairy field spider. Mm, this doesn't look very hairy. But it's closely related to the hairy field spider. One of the orb webs. And he's, she is sitting on her orb. We've got a couple of flies. Probably devoured them. And it's having a very pleasant Saturday morning. OK, let's go over... To Tristan. Sorry about that, James, that you had to do a long segment. Um, we were just on Yard Road North, so the signal was very, very bad. Um, but we back now on all is good. Um, we've managed to make our way onto um, Quarry Pan Road. I'm just trying to see if there's any sign of Columba from last night in this area. I'm hoping that she's kind of come out somewhere and left a track or if not come out he's got a kill and is up in a tree somewhere so just driving nice and slow along this area just scanning there's so lots of beautiful trees that a leopard can sit in um, in this section so you never know maybe we get lucky with that um, it's been a very long time since I've seen a leopard on a kill that's for sure James, you're asking since I'm going to be traversing more areas soon, am I um, looking forward to seeing any um, particular leopards? Um, so, I mean, the traverse is going to be obviously Cheetah Plains, Torchwood, and Buffalo's Hook um, while I'm at Tumberta. Um, so, Inkanyeni and the Cub would be nice. Um, that would be a cool one to go see. Um, Monzo would be nice if she's around. Quarantine. Um, which is not a new leopard, but it would just be nice to see him. Um, Gijima would be nice. Um, Klanguleni, um, up in the north, that would be cool. Um, Kuchava and the cub, maybe. Um, so yeah, there's a few that I would like to see. Um, did I say in Klanguleni? That's the wrong leopard. <laughs> Um, forgetting his name now. Anyway, the male leopard up in the north. Uh, <laughs> Shangulani is the one that's uh, down at Sugita. Oh, hello, orbweb spider. Garden orbweb that is busy disappearing up into the boughs of the tree. Sorry, BK, this is the most horrible light and place that the spider has positioned itself. Uh, Wendy. 
try to see if I can get around a little bit before it goes anywhere, but the light really isn't ideal. There we go, that's a bit better. It's a little bit better. So there's a beautiful garden orb web spider. Uh, you can see it there. It's not easy. Up a little bit bigger. There we go. No, you just got to rack focus. You got to rack focus. It's closer to you, so it's like a white blob up a little bit. There we go. Now just pull focus closer to us. Away. There we go. <laughs> so um, difficult to see it on on a little LCD screen on the camera. Um, so much much easier for me to just kind of make it out um, from my bigger screen but there we go like I say a nice beautiful big female garden orb they're around a lot at the moment there's quite a few of them that I've seen on walks and um, even driving around a little bit um, so yeah it would be nice if the gar golden orb webs would be as m sort of prolific as the garden orb webs at this stage but you can see kind of beautiful sort of banding on the legs there that yellow and kind of gray abdomen that they have and then those big fangs that come out in the front and these guys obviously chomp down on all kinds of insects and well anything really any manner of things that can get into their web that doesn't break through it um, they generally are able to subdue um, it's a pretty cool close-up of one of them you can even make out the spinnerets um, on the back end there, they kind of the protrusions um, that you see, which is very cool. Consulting detective, you say it does look like a big female. Um, and females generally in these guys are much larger um, and bigger. Um, they, the males typically much smaller. Also the females in the orb web species generally are far more brightly colored than the males and it's because of their size. Um, the males can go a little bit more undetected and can be a bit more neutral in color because they blend in um, and are hard to see. Um, whereas, you know, these guys, because they're so big, um, makes sense to have these kind of bright aprosomatic colors that allows them to kind of deter birds and things from even trying to come and attack them. Um, so you often find the females a lot more brightly colored. I can tell you though, it has gotten hot already. The sun is warm. It's going to be very, very warm today. I wonder if this is that heat before the rain, because apparently we're supposed to have had rain um, either today or yesterday. So maybe this is the heat that's going to bring the rain a little bit later. Kind of hope not though. Anna, you're asking why they hang upside down. Maybe they just like head rushes. Um, I don't know, I mean, obviously they do move around a lot, um, but most of the time you see them kind of with face down. Um, maybe they, I actually honestly don't know the answer to it. Most of the time though, you, are, you do see them this way around. Um, maybe that just stops any of the, the drain, or just stops any sort of lymph draining from the brain area. Um, if they sit this way, maybe this, that's why. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Um, it's an interesting question, um, one that I do not have the answer for, I'm afraid. Very cool there. You can see how thick that web is, that stay line is incredibly strong. If you were to go and grab that and pull, you know, the whole branch that it's attached to will pull with it. Um, it's incredibly strong stuff that all webs produce, or all web spiders produce. Um, they uh, have one of the most, well, it's one of the strongest natural substances that we get out in nature um, for its diameter. Coffee Queen, there's no stinger on the back of the spider, it's just the shape of the abdomen. So from this angle it, it does look like a, a kind of stinger but it's not the case. These guys have a very kind of serrated edge to their abdomen. Um, I don't know if maybe somebody can help us and post a photo or a screenshot from one of the other sightings we've had of a sort of proper top side view of one um, so that you can see it's not actually a sting at all it's just a kind of protrusion within the abdomen um, so it's a kind of growth much like a, a warthog sort of wart essentially um, it's just the shape of the spider's abdomen but it's got no relevance to to being 
uh, stinger or there's no kind of toxin in there or anything like that. Um, all of the business end is in the front when it comes to spiders. Um, but how cool is that? Such a cool view of a spider, that's for sure. Nice. All right, let's carry on and leave our spider to itself. I'm stealing James's thunder on bushwalk here a little bit. Um, spiders are the best thing for bushwalk. You can sit with them for hours. Um, particularly if it's a, a day where there's lots of insects, um, you often find them kind of hitting the web and then you can watch the spiders hunting, which is pretty cool. Um, all right, let's meander our way along towards Gwari Pan and then round to Bifuzuk Dam. See if there's any sign of the Klalamba. In the meantime, though, let's send you across to James, who I'm sure can attest to the fact that the sun is starting to warm up. It is breaking down upon us, breaking down. Now, yesterday evening, I called the signal grass Dactyloctinium, but of course it is not. It is Eurocloa. Thank you, Judy. Here is Dactyloctinium. Are you amazed, Owen? This is crow's foot. Or Dactyloctinium. Mm. It's quite nice to hold, actually. It's quite nice to touch. Yes, James, I'm ready for James Richard's comment on my butterfly incompetence. A twilight brown. We were going with the other one there. Okay, not a common bush brown, but a twilight brown. All right, thank you for that, James. Again, not sure what took you so long this time. I mean, uh, did you fall asleep? What's, what's going on? You're losing your touch? <laughs> I really don't normally have to wait a whole segment before I get the answer. Let's just go in here a little bit. There's some frogs calling. Quite a cheek to expect me to wait for a whole segment before I get my answer. Alicia, I've never heard of a dwarf frog, no. Now, what is making that noise? Can we see it? There it is. You see that lily? It's around that lily. Can you guys hear it? I'm not sure if you can hear it. <coughs> Yeah, he's, he's in the reeds there. Take the app out again. I mean, that's such an obvious sound. I really should be able to find that one. Uh, no, it's not that one. Not that one. It's not that one. It's definitely not a painted reed frog. It's not a water lily frog. It's not a casino, of course. That's a dwarf puddle frog. Sounds quite close. Somebody saw him on the leaf, flossing, is that your name? Helsing says he's on the lily. I think one of the puddle frogs is what we have here. Yeah, that's a, does that sound like him. Mm, that sounds quite close. The sharp-nosed grass frog. Yeah, he's in. The, he's in amongst the grass there. Sounded quite like a sharp-nosed grass frog, but he's now stopped calling because he knows we're listening to him.
Yes, Peter, frogs can float. Absolutely. Especially when they're dead, they float. There's lots of oxygenating vegetation in this little pond. I imagine it. There, there's the frog. Oh, it's gone below the surface of the... There are a few of them. Every time I point, they come up. Let me get my binoculars out. This is quite cool, actually. Just move... If we move slowly and don't sort of point too enthusiastically at the surface of the water, they keep sticking their heads out. There are quite a few of them here. to move very slowly to make sure that they don't run away from you as soon as I see you move they keep sticking their heads up but then when I bring my binoculars to bear they hide again Yeah, Ruth, you say you can never find a frog when you hear one. It is a problem. Nighttime is best for frogging. Also, you know, it's not ideal to catch them, but that's the only real, really good way to identify them. There you can hear one calling behind me. That's one of the puddle frogs. Especially to get a frog on camera, I mean, you really have to catch it. But that can be really nasty for the frog. Okay, well, I think we tried hard at this little pond. But I don't think we're going to have any luck. Not without making you very bored anyway. So I think we'll move on. In the meantime, Tristan is moving probably towards Biffleshook Dam. Let's go to him. I am indeed. I was just trying to see if there's any tracks for Tlalamba coming out of this block from yesterday. I mean, we, I think she was out of the block before we actually even came here yesterday. I think we must have missed the tracks, but no sign of her this morning on any of the roads, not at Quarry Pan. No, there's hippo pools, so it seems as though she hasn't come out this side, if she did come out. Um, I'm hoping maybe we'll check the boundary and then check down Cheetah Cut Line and we might get lucky. But that's our Egyptian goose family. They're getting very big now, aren't they? Um, it looks like we're going to be adding eight more Egyptian geese to the world, which I'm not really sure how excited I am about that. I mean, obviously it's nice that they <laughs> have raised their chicks, but... Um, Egyptian geese are already a menace to society um, within um, the South African ecosystem. They are absolutely everywhere and overrunning the place at this stage. So another eight of them is probably not really what we need. Um, but for these parents, I suppose it will be a happy day um, and a successful one in that they've managed to um, successfully defend their chicks after what is probably been a disastrous few years for them. I believe you're all very happy that there's still eight goslings. Um, James is probably the one that is most um, kind of happy about it because he always used to call these uh, the worst parents in the world and so they're now proving James wrong. I wonder if they know, and that's why they're like, oh, that's it. I'm going to prove James Henry wrong. I'm going to have my chicks. The thing is, though, is in all honesty, it's because the rains have been good, and Bifflesuk Dam is now the perfect place to raise them. 
Um, the last few times they've had them, Bafasuk Dam has been a sort of muddy cesspool, um, which has attracted the attention of a number of different animals. We haven't had nearly as much water, and so we know that the one season Hosanna hung around here, and he was chasing the chicks around, and so, you know, there's been various different predators when it was much drier, because it was attracting a lot more predators to the waterhole. Um, whereas now this year there's so much water and it's so much bigger that they can get away. And um, no, I've never seen or heard of these guys eating frogs. Um, so they're not that way inclined. They uh, typically filter feeders. Most ducks and geese are. Um, so they have like little combs. So oh, there's a hippo. Hello hippo. And there's two hippos. Let me go on the damn wall so we can see them. As Egyptian geese have gone far. Um, they're basically comb feeders, so they have these little combs, much like a whale almost, and the filter feeds. Um, as they go through the surface, you often see them putting their thing down and kind of going like this. Um, they'll also eat grass. Um, it's often why when you find their, their droppings, it's got a green tinge to it, um, as they feed off the grasses and things that are close to the edge of the water. Oof, this light is not ideal. It's kind of coming from the east, which is, means it's absolutely smashing into us off the water here. Um, so there's a heavy reflection. Um, our hippos seem to be quite shy now that we're up on the dam wall. Um, I think there's two of them here uh, that are milling about. It's weird to see how the hippo movements have gone, because some days you come and there's hippos, some days you come there isn't. So I don't really know why they're bouncing around so much. It's not like this is not a nice place to spend time, but maybe it's just because they're feeding... Um, maybe it's because they, as they go feeding they come across another big water hole and just decide that's where they'll spend the, the next day and then kind of have a, a route that they start to walk but you can just hear them breathing and their noses coming up every now and then um, they seem to be incredibly shy this particular or uh, well, these particular two um, they don't like really to be seen The other day on school drive, I was trying to get them out in the open, but they just didn't want anything to do with it. Um, all we got was just ripples more than anything else. Whew, but it is hot today. Really, girl? Um, yeah, we all just, you know, love, a, love to tuck into a hippo every now and then. Um, it's a bit of a delicacy. We don't really talk about it because a bit, you know, um, against the moral code, but you know, we, we like a little hippo meat here and there. Um, it's kind of feeds the camp for large portions of the month. No, um, <laughs> no one on the reserve eats them. Uh, it's completely against the law. Um, the reserve is a protected area, which means you may not hunt any of these animals that are out here and eat them. Um, and so, no, uh, is the answer to that. Funny enough, South Africans in general. Um, even outside of the reserves are not huge fans of hippo um, so you don't see a lot of people killing and eating hippos but if you go up into East Africa um, there's a, a tribe and I forget the name of them now but they're on the escarpment on just south of the the, Mar, uh, the Kenya border inside Tanzania and they are big hippo hunters they hunt hippos almost daily to try and get them um, and in a crazy manner as well um, they actually wade into the water with spears um, and try and spear them, which is not nice for the animal. But there is an element of bravery or stupidity there, and I'm not sure which one it is. Um, to go wading into water and throw a spear at a hippo takes some kind of courage, um, that's for sure. Um, but anyway, yeah, they do that, in, especially in the Mara River where there's crocodiles and all kinds of other nonsense that goes on there. Um, it's seriously taking your life into your own hands and they basically spear it until it dies and then they uh, take it out. So hippo poaching is a big problem um, in the Mara ecosystem, uh, particularly on the Serengeti side. Um, but here in South Africa, funny enough, a lot of the local people don't actually go after hippos that much. We still have really good hippo populations outside of the protected areas, um, which is interesting. I think in South Africa, the livestock game has really kind of changed things in many respects. So a lot more kind of beef and goats and um, sheep and uh, and 
um, have really kind of changed the landscape of what people eat. Lisa G, crocodiles will eat a hippo if it's dead, yeah. Um, but a crocodile's got no chance in attacking a hippo of that size. It's going to end up being killed um, if it tries to go after a hippo of that size. So sometimes they'll try to go after the baby hippos. Um, but that too has a serious amount of risk involved because um, baby hippos have a mother. And mothers have big jaws and teeth and get very angry when... Uh, their baby is touched so um, it would have to me be if the baby was in some way injured or the mother wasn't around which is very seldom um, that it would happen but they will eat a dead hippo um, so let's say one of these hippos just died and there was a crocodile here it would certainly feed off them um, but they don't actively hunt them um, and try and go after them a crocodile will eat just about any meat All right, we're going to leave Bifelsuk Dam because I'm honestly being blinded by the reflection of the sun off the water at the moment. <laughs> so while we kind of carry on and see if we can find any tracks for Clalamba, let's send you back across to James. We are, we are now wandering up, well, sort of back towards the valley of the great Maloa Marty. haven't found anything in addition to the things that we've shown you so far. Frogs are a disaster, so let's see what we can find up through here. Haven't heard any sounds of elephants at all. Oh, here's a relatively interesting grass, Bothria Cloa in Sculptor. No, this one here. Bothria Cloa in Sculptor. And what's interesting about Bothria Cloa in Sculptor is its smell. It's got a sort of um, spicy citrus smell, which is really nice. And although it's a pretty good grazing grass, I think that the inflorescences protect themselves from being eaten by having this kind of strong citrusy smell. Mm. It does verge on stink bug at times. But it's really nice when it's slightly older than this. So that's Bothria Clara in Sculptor, or the Pinhole Grass. I think it's called Pinhole Grass in English. Pinhole. Pin, pin, pinhole Grass. Good. On we go. Here's a relatively easy butterfly. There we are. That is a orange tip, I think. Some of the tips are not as obviously named as they look. Well, I'm pretty sure that's an orange tip. Can you see him there? Tip. Yes. My conclusion is the common orange tip on that one. Mm, is it though? Or is it the Bushveld orange tip? And how would I tell the difference? Oh. Yeah, it might be. Yes, I think I'm going to go with Bushveld orange tip, actually, before James jumps on the tweet. Shall we go with Bushveld orange tip? I say that because the tip on the common orange tip is not quite so obvious when the wings are folded. And this one's got nice, obvious fold obvious orange when it folds its wings. Bushveld or common orange tip. I think I'm going to go with the Bushveld one. We'll wait for our lepidoptrical, the lepi, lep, the lepidopterical genius. Saurus, you said it's also oh very pretty. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Very pretty indeed. Good. And then, of course, the brown that we saw was the twilight brown. Maybe I should show you that. I don't 
fact, I can't find it. Why can't I find the twilight brown? Hmm. I wonder I didn't see it. Anyway, I'll look later. So, common bushveld brown, or common... <laughs> you can't have both. Bushveld brown or... Uh, common orange tip or bushveld orange tip. I think it's the bushveld one. Let's carry on down through here. Towards the valley of the Mulwati or Mluamati. And then start to head back towards the north. Vicky, you're agreeing that it's a bushveld orange tip? Yes, I think that that's the correct identification. A bushveld orange tip. It's amazing the different details that people see. People who are naturally, I don't know, naturally um, have a natural aptitude to see a detail are really good at identifying birds and butterflies and that sort of thing. Whereas some of people like me really have to look hard to see detail. Others, you know, for others it just it pops out at them. It's also interesting, it's the same with sounds. What sounds like something, your experience of sound is a very subjective thing. And I, I learned this when I was working for wilderness safaris. And I would work in collaboration with their marketing uh, people and their marketing director specifically, who would sometimes, you know, when we wanted a song and not to pay, we didn't want to pay huge royalties for it, I would then kind of make a copy, if you know what I mean. And I would make what I thought was a really accurate sounding copy, just slightly different harmony, but the beat was the same and that sort of stuff. And to him, it would just never sound right. And I'd say, but I mean, what's the difference here? And he'd say it's he would be hearing something completely different and eventually would be able to get to the point where he'd understand why I thought it sounded like it did and why he didn't think it sounded like it Right, so it sounds like we had, unfortunately, got some sort of issue with James, so you're with us at the moment. Um, and we're just slowly kind of going down Cheetah Cut Line. No sign of Glorama going north into Bofuzuk that I could see, um, unless she just crossed straight over and I missed it. Um, but nothing also on Cheetah Cut Line, so I don't know if maybe she maybe found something in this block and has decided to, or managed to kill it and has it hoisted or is in a little small kind of bush or something that we just can't see her. Um, at the moment though, there's, there's really no indication that she left this area. Like I say, it's possible she did yesterday and we just kind of missed a track somewhere. The road that runs on the northern side of this between um, the fire break and kind of where she was is so flooded at the moment it's almost impossible to make our tracks on that road so um, she could easily have gone across there I suppose it's very very possible um, yeah I don't know I'm kind of just hoping that we are going to pick up her tracks somewhere um, when I checked worry pan there was nothing there to speak of um, so I'm not sure if maybe she's milling about. I see our giraffe that we saw yesterday has been walking all over this area. Um, that's one track that we are finding. It's in the road as it's kind of walking down. I wouldn't be surprised we bump into this giraffe somewhere around here. Um, seems as though it had a nice little stroll down the cut line um, during the course of last night. It's interesting though, it's kind of dragging its feet. It's quite a common thing to see in giraffe tracks, is they often do 
drag their feet a little bit. Sorry, Mika. Just wanted to show you on the track in front here. You can see how there's this kind of footprint and then there's a drag in front of it. So that's um, quite typical of giraffe tracks, particularly on very soft substrate. You find as they walk, they kind of just pull their foot along um, and there's often a little kind of scrape in front of them. Um, it's not something to be concerned about. It's not that this animal is in dire need of something, I don't think. Um, you can see because it happens on, on sort of both legs um, at various points um, as they walk along. But it's just cool to kind of have a look at different types of tracks. Right, sounds like James has sorted out his signal and is back up and running. So let's send you back across to him. Here we've got some pretty yellow flowers. Sorry about our loss of signal there. I'm not sure what happened. I don't know what these flowers are. But I think that they are, well, I feel like we've got something, we've got similar kinds of flowers around the place. You've got the very compound leaf, the obvious compound leaf. Oh, and in fact, they've got pea pods as well. Let me show you. Oh, go away, you foul flies. We had a park cut last night, and so we're doubly irritated because all the mosquitoes savaged us last night without the aid of our fans. There's the pod. You see their own? Yes. So perhaps part of the pea family. Very nice. Like I said, I don't know what it is. We'll try and figure it out. I'll take a picture quickly and then put a label on it as and when I can find out what it is. haven't heard anything from any elephant today. FC is wondering if I enjoy the advances in technology that enable me to identify things in real time. Um, yes, I do. I mean, it's, it's not so much... An, I guess it is an advance in technology in so much as I'm asking other people and they're telling me, and that's making the learning process that much faster, which I really do enjoy. Also, of course, all of you are so forthcoming with your knowledge, which is fantastic. OK, on we go. It's actually stopped getting hotter, which is quite nice. I thought it was going to be beastly, beastly hot today. And it's not too bad. We're also, believe it or not, in the region of Hypocanthus amina, the spiny gardenia. Will we see that? That will be exciting, won't it? We'll shut down the internet if we find that again. Hypocanthus amina. I think it was along this very path. Oh, I'll be so excited if we find him. We may be a little bit further along there. Oh! No, I don't think it is, Judy. Judy's wondering if that's not the Camichrysta biensis I showed you a few days ago. Let me just go into the shade here. I'll be so embarrassed if it is. I'll be so deeply embarrassed. That one I labelled, I thought. Mm, not seeing it currently. I do remember it. Oh, I remember you telling me about it. Let me just quickly look here. OK, 
Chemi Christa Beansis. Oh, no, it's not. You mean the, the dwarf camel's foot? No, it's not the dwarf camel's foot. Definitely not. That's Chemi... Oh, no, that's Chemi Christa Absis. Oh, dear. Oh, here's Chemi Christa Beansis. Um... I don't think it is, Judy. I thought it was very closely related to that, though it looks like that. So that's the photograph I have of Camo Christa biensis. But I thought the flower, I mean, that's not a great picture of the flower. I thought the flower was slightly different. But it might not be. You might be absolutely correct. See, I recognize the leaf, but I did not recognize the flower. But maybe you're absolutely right. Hamacrista biensis. Um, well, now I can add that flower, if that's what it is. I'll go and check. If you're convinced, let me know, and I will just add it. Thank you for that. Hamacrista biensis. That means it's the same genus as the crow's foot, as the camel foot. Right, here we have got some asparagus. Now, there are lots of different kinds of these asparagus plants. And this is a particularly exuberant example. And they are, in fact, edible. You can eat the roots. You can put them in water, boil them, and eat them. The leaves, not so much. I wouldn't like to eat these leaves. They're quite spiky and unpleasant. Marion, is there a cobalt grass in the Aryan? I don't know how to answer that question. Kogon, can you spell that for me? C O G O N, Kogon grass. I don't know of one, Marion. I don't know of a Kogon grass. Uh, it's just a leaf. Never mind. What have you found, sir? Ah, fantastic. A mammal. Can you believe it? Look over there, Owen. Can you see it? A giraffe. Naturally running away as fast as possible. So just an off the vehicle. Let's try and get a better look. Morris, should we go around here? Let's follow me. Let's see if we can get a bit better look at the giraffe. It's nice to see. They're just not common here, are they? about 10 flyers today. I'm becoming quite an expert at it. Here he goes. He's going to come into this gap here. He's gone. Did you get him? There he is. Did you get him? going around here. I think he might actually be on the road. We could probably get a view of him in the open. Completely aware of us, of course. seeing us, this chap, but let's get out into the open. Might make him feel less like we're about to prey on him. I 
All right, let's go back to Tristan while we try and catch up with our giraffe. Well, and we've also just found what we were looking for, which is the tracks for Klalamba. I think they tracks for Klalamba. It's either her or Tandi, one of the two of them. But um, the bad news is that they're heading straight east and we're not far from Cheetah Cut Line at all. But these are on top of my vehicle tracks from yesterday afternoon. You can see them kind of going. In fact, they even look like they're on top of your vehicle tracks from this morning. So we're going to try and see if we can find. I walked past the bush now where they sent Mark or where she sent Mark and it still smells very strongly. Um, so I'm hoping that she's just milling about somewhere here or lying next to the road and hasn't crossed into Torchwood already. But it's not looking good because Torchwood is really, really close. Um, so we'll just have to see if we get lucky. She's walking kind of middle of the road at the moment. Ah, oh, Clalamba, if it is you, which I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> We've run circles around us last night. We obviously were just close, we just didn't pick her up. And we drove all these roads in the hope of seeing her last night, so our instincts were right, it's just timing was wrong, I'm afraid. Which is generally the case at the moment. Um, unfortunately, it's just the way it is. is the bush is so thick that you've just got to be the perfect timing where they come onto the road at the same time you do. Um, if they're lying down off the road, you've got very little chance still going. So I'm pretty sure she's going to have crossed into Torchwood. Let's just check. Yep, straight across. So she has gone. Cross into Torchwood. Um, that's that, I'm afraid. Not much we can do with it. We will just carry on. It's all right, this afternoon I'll go and track that down. <laughs> can actually go into torture this afternoon we'll go and have a little look around um, but it is what it is Tingana fan not generally no um, you can sometimes in very very soft substrates so if they stand where there is an area that is deep kind of sand and sometimes the retractable claws because of the flex of the foot as they press on that sand it can kind of just push out slightly um, and you can get a little register of that claw um, but generally no um, generally the claw is well in and the, the fur around it protects it from making any um, little mark on the on the actual track itself what's pretty cool is I mean, not with them so much but um, sometimes funny enough if you get certain species so like a brown hyena they actually when they walk because their feet are so hairy you actually get their little hairs on the track which is pretty cool um, so with leopards and lions sometimes if it's the substrate is right you can actually pick up the little hairs on their toes which is pretty cool so but yeah claws very 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 seldom do you pick it up in a track all right well unfortunately that plan has now been foiled um, but we're gonna just kind of scrounge around maybe she comes back over the boundary it's always just worth checking um, I, one of the guy, Juma guys is gonna go into torture it and check so while we kind of scratch here let's send you back across to James and see if he's got a view of that giraffe yet look at this creature it is a lizard but I don't know what kind of lizard it is Anybody got any ideas? Its colours are remarkable. I think it's a youngster. 
And as it's foraging along, it's looking for beetles and things. I've watched it chase two beetles. And it's pretty relaxed. Can you see it's alone? He's just about two feet in front of me. There, in the grass. Gorgeous black and gold colour with a slightly coppery tail. He's coming back out. He's allowing me to really close. There he comes, he's on the road. He's unbelievably fast. Look at that colour, hey? And see how he lifts his whole body off the ground when he moves. Do you reckon he's got a long tail? He does. It's as long as his body. Wow. It's an impressive animal, that. I wish I knew what he was. Try to sit down next to him. Mm. He's moved because of my shadow, I think. He's moving quite slowly. Let's see if he doesn't catch something. He'd be an ideal snack for a bird, but I wonder if his coloration doesn't put the birds off. Yeah. James Richard says it's a bush felt lizard. Is it a junior one? Bushfoot lizards were a little duller than that as adults. Maybe they aren't. Thank you, James. I'm sneaking closer and closer to him, trying to get a good picture. He's just stunning. This is a male in some sort of um, display coloration. And the closer you get, the more amazing his colors become because there's actually a slight shade of greenish blue outlining the yellow. Well, you'd think it might mean that, Tingana fan, but I'm not convinced. I mean, uh, you know, water monitor's the same colour, and they're not poisonous. How cool is he? He's so cool. Now he's giving us a little scratch. This is just wonderful. 
Now he's hugging a little bit of a little bit of soil. Oh, what a magnificent little creature you are! <laughs> I think that is just great. Lovely when he lifts his. He lifts his tummy up when he starts moving. There he caught something. He caught a fly. Well done, Mr. Bushfelt Lazard. Good job. <sighs> cool. Now he's seeking out the shade of Owen's body. I think. <sighs> no, he's just moving off. Good. That was a really nice little segment. Let's go back to Tristan, who is apparently on bush drive. It sounds like an epic sighting, James. Seeing bushfall lizard catching a fly. That's very, very cool. And one less fly, which is even better. Um, <laughs> I know I shouldn't say things like that, but to be honest with you, the amount of blood that has been taken from me by these flies over the last few days um, is more than enough to say that they deserve their own a little bit. Um, BK and I have been hammered once again this morning um, and I don't think it's going to let up anytime soon. As long as we've got as much water as we do, we're going to be having a fly problem for a while, um, unfortunately. But yeah, since you last saw us, not much has changed, very, very little. Um, in the way of animals, um, no trucks, no anything. I just came down sort of Mumba Loop area just to check if there's any sign of Tundi. Um, like I say, I think the track that we were following there is Clalumbas, not Tundi's. Um, but I might be wrong. It might, this might be Tundi's track. Um, it's a female track is all I know. Um, but given where Clalumba was yesterday, that makes sense because it kind of came out of the block um, close to Gwari Pan and then onto central and out, so it would make sense for Clalumba's movements. She likes to hang around there and often get her at that very junction where she came out of the block, so I suppose I've seen Tundi there too, to be honest, um, so it could be either one. But anyway, I thought I'd come down here just to make sure there isn't any sign of Tundi if that is Clalumba, um, but there isn't. Um, no sign of uh, walking around this area. I wonder where she is at the moment. She must be hiding out somewhere, maybe Torchwood. I'm actually going to see if I can spend some time looking for her over the course of the next couple of days. Um, uh, I've got some guests that are actually viewers, so they'll know the leopards well. It would be nice to actually go and try and um, spend some time looking for her on Torchwood. There's also the other nice thing is that I, this sounds like the Talamatis with all the cubs on a wildebeest kill for hook, so I'm quite looking at actually seeing all those little ones. Um, they are super cute and seem to be full of beans. Um, there's quite a few of those little cubs now, so that'll be a nice thing to go and kind of look at and, and spend time with. So I think maybe that'll be the plan for this afternoon and then we can start the leopard focus. Um, in the morning. So I'll see what the afternoon brings. Nice to explore new parts though, that's for sure. Conscious, yes. <laughs> um, I've lost a cell phone. Well, I, I always found them, but get back to camp and realize that you've lost them. Cell phone, sunglasses. Um, Bits of camera equipment, so like lens caps, um, what else? Thing. Yeah? Water bottle, yeah, that's always a common one. So yeah, well, there's a few things um, that I've lost. Actually, the one day, um, I don't, I honestly don't know how we found them, but we followed 
Mm, was it Tingano or was it Tundi? One of the two of them. We followed them through that horrendous drainage line off, um, off of uh, Nyala Road South and we went through and round and up and down and it was just a disaster. I think it was Tundi actually, you know, I remember now. And I had my sunglasses with me um, on the vehicle and they obviously somehow had bounced off and out and I only realized when we got home that they had, and it was an evening drive, so it was now completely dark and so I had to retrace my steps through that heinous block um, and eventually actually found the sunglasses in the long grass. How, I'm not quite sure. It was this kind of just a random little glint from the spotlight and we managed to find them so that was pretty cool. Um, I once had to do retrace an entire three hour game drive to find a guest cell phone once. Um, that was that was a long day. Um, it took us about two hours until we eventually found it lying next to the road. Luckily all okay. Um, but we do find um, we do find often cell phones on the ground that have been completely squished because what happens sometimes they fall out of people's pockets and then down onto the ground and then the back tire goes over it and end of cell phone and um, funny enough actually this particular cell phone that I have is uh, an absolute beast um, I have driven over this one twice now and it is still working um, the screen protectors both times got um, a little bit kind of bent out of shape and, and we're in not great shape afterwards so I had to peel those off but the actual screen itself and the phone itself is absolutely fine which is pretty incredible um, again it just falls out of your pocket and kind of lands on the road and you end up driving over it um, but yeah it's a good it's a good advert for that particular phone um, that it's managed to survive two um, car incidents good I'm just gonna slowly start bumbling kind of back towards camp and hope that we maybe pick something up. In the meantime though, let's send you back across to James and find out if he's lost any items out here in the wilderness. I've left my binoculars behind from time to time during bushwalk segments and had to go back and find them. But thankfully that has not happened for a while. I uh, lost uh, camera, lens covers, that sort of stuff. What we're looking at here, I believe, or the eggs of a lace wing on stalks. Isn't that amazing? Now, I didn't stop here to look for eggs of a lace wing. I stopped here to look for the eggs, at least not for the eggs, for a flea beetle, because this is Rusquenzia in which the flea beetle exists. And James Richard was asking about them. But I can't see any on this particular plant. Anyway, there is what I think are lacewing eggs on their stalks. Some of them have hatched, some of them have not. Not to say they all will hatch. Cool, eh? All right, let's leave the lacewing eggs. I don't know why they lay them like that. Normally happens at night, apparently. I do think that that's quite cool to have found them. All righty. I'll keep looking for some flea beetles around here. The flea beetles are wonderful creatures because they are very good at jumping, really. Also got very toxic larvae. On we go. Elizabeth, the average we walk on a bush walk is probably about six kilometers or so, which in miles is three and a half, four miles, not four miles. So not very far. Over the course of three hours, that's not very far. If we did it in sort of 20 minutes, that would be quite far in that amount of time, but in three hours, it's, it's a stroll. It's a gentle doddle, unless we happen to be on the tracks, but in weather like this, you can't follow tracks at any speed at all. We just need to be a little bit careful that we don't bump into our male lion, who is a little bit further north of us here. We shall attempt to avoid him. 
I think he's probably fast asleep down in the river. What a nice surprise that was to have this morning, wasn't it great? It's special to start off a drive like that. And plenty of devil's thorn. Um, I haven't stopped to pick any up. It tends to be a plant that we do really very often, so I haven't stopped for one. But if I find one, I'll show you. There's lots of it around. It may lose them here, but it'll come up again as we go down up the other side. So don't panic. Oh, it's lovely water flow in this part of the world. Magnificent. Male lion may have moved and it was sort of across away from where he was. The thing is, in bush like this, is you can give a lion like that a fright, and then just by virtue of his standing up and going, <laughs> uh, you'll get a big fright yourself. Even if all he's saying is, good grief, what are you doing here? Which is most likely all he would be saying. Okay, apparently our signal is not great, so let's go back to Tristan. No, it doesn't sound like it, James, but that's okay. It happens. It's summer after all, and so signal becomes a little bit intermittent in places, particularly the low-lying areas. I actually forgot earlier when we were talking about uh, losing things, I have lost some stuff in the bush, and there was one actual trip in particular that was a nightmare, and it was the CGTN trip to Tanzania that I did with uh, David. Um, the two of us, we, we left lots of ourselves in, uh, <laughs> in Tanzania. Um, I lost a jersey, a pair of binoculars, David lost a pair of sunglasses, so we didn't do very well there at all. But it's because we were kind of shooting out the top of the roof, and um, so the roof didn't have, it didn't close, and so what we would do is we'd often sit on the top and then look at things or, you know, put something down because you were busy with something, and then you'd drive off forgetting, and whoop, off it would go. So... Not really ideal, um, but is what it is. <laughs> um, yeah, the binos hurt a little bit because the binos were only about five months old when I lost them, so that wasn't great. Now I have ones that I strapped to myself, and now I don't have to worry. X Ranger almost daily. Um, in fact, I don't think there was much mine to lose. I was, probably a bit nutty before I even started this job but yes tracking leopards every day certainly um, it's not good one for one's mental health um, you end up losing your mind quite regularly um, when out here um, especially tracking Klalamba she is the one that is really the tough one out of them all um, Tingana is you know he kind of walks but you kind of have an idea of where he's gonna be um, but Lalamba is just a nightmare. Just don't really know what direction she's going to pop out in. She might be heading a certain way, but then you find her tracks and she's going the complete opposite way sometimes. It's weird. Uh, but that'll all settle down. I'm sure once she becomes more territorial and she has cubs and things like that, I think she'll uh, become a lot more kind of, you know, one directional. Tandy, um, while she's difficult to follow and difficult to find, it's not because she doesn't walk in a direction. She typically is quite good with that. She kind of has a direction and she sort of follows it throughout the course of her sort of walking stint. Um, oh, hello, Millipede. Some life, it's a heartbeat, if one can call it that. But there's a millipede crossing the road, everybody. And um, we always talk about animals having right of way, so we shall wait for our millipede to negotiate its way through. No, don't turn around and go the opposite way now. Not smart, I'm afraid. Um, well, 
hills, I think. It depends. And it's sometimes it's sunrise, sometimes it's 